Hello BNG 312 class. Uh, welcome back to the uh, final exam review lecture. Uh, just a few things to finish up here. Uh, we were about to get into oxygen transfer uh, in solution uh, from gas bubble to cell and there are about eight different um, steps to gas oxygen transfer from uh, a gas bubble that's filled with air or pure oxygen to get to uh, an individual cell in a bioreactor. Um, and you can see them here, um, different barriers to overcome, and some are more significant than others. So um, first of all, we'll start from the gas bubble itself. Transfer of oxygen through the bulk gas phase in the bubble to the surface is relatively fast because it's just gas moving through gas. The gas-liquid interface, so the gas uh, oxygen going from the gas phase into this film that surrounds the gas bubble is uh, really contributing negligible resistance. So uh, we don't need to call it significant in terms of um, what takes the most time to get gas uh, oxygen from the gas phase to uh, a cell. So there's negligible resistance there. Step three, we have the liquid film that surrounds gas bubbles. So this liquid film is a lot like the liquid film that surrounds the um, immobilized catalyst beads. Um, it is poorly mixed and it contributes a lot of mass transfer resistance. Um, so this, so oxygen traversing this film is one of the major resistances to oxygen transfer from gas to cells. And once it is, once oxygen has passed through this film layer, which again acts like a boundary layer, so once it's passed through and it gets into the bulk liquid, the bulk liquid is pretty well mixed. Um, and if it is well mixed, then concentration gradients <coughs> are minimized. And the journey from the outside of the gas bubble um, or the outside of that liquid film to the liquid film surrounding a cell or cell clump <coughs> is really not a significant impediment to mass transfer. So mass transfer resistance in this region is small. <coughs> and now there's the liquid film that surrounds each microbial cell. And we've got two scenarios here. We've got looking at an individual cell versus looking at a cell clump. And depending on which one we're doing, if we get an individual cell, of course, the liquid film is going to be the smallest. If we've got a cell clump, the liquid film that surrounds that cell clump will be bigger than a liquid film surrounding one individual cell. However, each liquid film, whether we're talking a cell clump or an individual cell, uh, both of those liquid films are much thinner than that around the air bubbles themselves. So this is not as significant a um, barrier to mass transfer there's not a significant amount of resistance here um, with these liquid films surrounding cell or cell clumps. So mass transfer effects in this region, in that liquid film region surrounding either cells or cell clumps, can generally be neglected. When cells are in clumps, we have intraparticle resistance because if we consider oxygen attempting to get to a individual cell somewhere in the middle of a cell clump, we can see that it would have a lot of other cells as well as a lot of potentially extracellular polymeric substances to traverse through, um, making it a little bit difficult. Uh, and that resistance in this cell clump or cell particle is likely to be significant. It's like the effects of diffusion going through a biofilm, let's say. And uh, those are significant, we know, because we devoted a whole class to calculating the diffusion through um, biofilms. <coughs> but the magnitude of the resistance is going to depend on the size of the cell clumps. 
regardless, if we're talking about cells in clumps, we have potentially two significant uh, resistances here. That resistance of that film surrounding the gas bubble and the resistance of the fill of the uh, particle, the intraparticle resistance to get to one individual cell. But again, this is variable depending on the size of the cell clump itself. Resistance at the liquid to cell surface interface in an individual cell, as we just talked about, is negligible. Intracellular oxygen transfer resistance is also negligible in an individual cell, and that is because it is such a small distance in an individual cell, in the cytoplasm of an individual cell. So we can ignore um, any resistance in the cytoplasm of, say, a bacterium or a yeast cell or some other individual cell. So in general, again, two major resistances. This poorly mixed film, uh, which is going to be quite large compared to the poorly mixed film that surrounds the cells, this poorly mixed film that surrounds any gas bubble. And if we're dealing with clumps, cell clumps, uh, the intraparticle resistance is significant. If we're only dealing with, dealing with individual planktonic cells in culture, then really our only resistance is again this in this liquid film surrounding a gas bubble. <clears throat> we consider KLA, or we use the term KLA, to as a mass transfer coefficient term, even though KL and A are actually two separate terms. They're usually shown together, KLA, um, and that's used to characterize the oxygen transfer capability of fermenters. So the maximum rate of oxygen transfer is going to occur when the concentration difference driving force, and this is true in a bioreactor, this is also true in the body, when that driving force is the highest, or when CAL uh, is zero. So um, our concentration, our high, maximum concentration minus our um, actual concentration in the bulk liquid. If it's, uh, if it's highest, then we have a maximum rate of transfer going on. And thus, the maximum cell concentration supported by oxygen transfer would be denoted as K, uh, KLA multiplied by the, con the maximum concentration of oxygen um, divided by the growth, the, uh, growth rate here, Q0. Okay, so we're dealing with diffusion, we're dealing with mass transfer both in the body and in bioreactors. <clears throat> in the body specifically, there are often two types of mass transfer at work here. The same could actually be said of the uh, any bioreactor as well, but it's a little more obvious in the body uh, that we've got two different types of mass transfer here. We've got convection and we've got diffusion. Convection is the f is shown as the flow of blood and other bodily fluids through conduits like veins um, and arteries and such. Uh, and this is uh, over s lo comparatively long distances. So this is how solutes get from place to place uh, over long distances, so like from your lungs, say, to your feet, for instance. Uh, diffusion. Would, uh, is exemplified by mass transfer across capillary walls um, from polymer embedded with drug inserted into the body, things like that. Diffusion is mass transfer over very short differences. <coughs> so we can consider two different types of boundary layers here. You know, there's the velocity boundary layer that we've been familiar with for most of the semester here. Um, and then there is also the concentration boundary layer, and they are both boundary layers in their own right, but they represent very different things. So we have solute in your blood, um, and it can diffuse from the surface of, you know, say there's a polymer plate in, in a blood vessel or a, a, a tube, uh, some sort of thing. 
it will diffuse from the surface of that and then be swept away by that convective flow. So solute, in a sense, um, if we're talking drug or whatever we're talking about, is transported away from the surface by first by diffusion and then by convection. So we see conf uh, diffusion over the course of the boundary layer here. Uh, basically the concentration boundary layer is the um, thickness um, above any plate or tube or whatnot, any surface uh, that is diffusing out drug, um, any non-zero concentration uh, of drug. And you can imagine the concentration profile in the concentration boundary layer looking a lot like this curve right here, where we have the highest concentration, C0, uh, down near the surface of, in this case, we're looking at a plate, let's say. And probably the lowest concentration, the lowest non-zero concentration, out right here at the edge of the concentration boundary layer thickness here. <clears throat> and then there's the velocity boundary layer, which, as we know from developed flow, or developing flow, is the boundary layer in which we're getting, um, we're seeing viscosity effects uh, in um, uh, the flow of fluid uh, f through a conduit. In this case, the blood vessels, the veins, the arteries, those are the conduits in, in, in question. So again, we have two different boundary layers. You have velocity and a concentration boundary layer. Uh, and we can look at you know, different uh, control volumes and determine what the boundary layer thicknesses are. And then we can calculate that ratio of boundary layer thicknesses, the concentration boundary layer thickness divided by the velocity boundary layer thickness. And this should usually, this is, is pretty much always less than one because the concentration boundary layer thickness will lie within the velocity boundary layer. And we can get an idea of that or we can predict this sort of thing looking at the, de the density uh, of fluid, um, the, the diffusivity divided by the viscosity uh, of the fluid. <coughs> So again, let's look at that uh, in terms of some crude definitions. What do these boundary layers even mean? Um, so we have the boundary layer is the layer of fluid near the surface of an object. And like I said, it could be the side of a tube, it could be a plate inserted into a blood vessel, but it's the layer of fluid near the surface of an object that something's diffusing out of where viscosity effects are significant. And there are two types of viscosity effects that we're looking at here. Uh, there is the velocity boundary layer, which is the viscosity effects on flow. And that's why we see decreases in velocity as we get towards the surface of uh, a pipe, the surface of a capillary, the surface of a, any blood vessel. We're seeing that viscosity effects, and that boundary layer gives us an idea of how far those um, viscosity effects reach to. And in developed flow, fully developed flow, we see that the viscosity effects reach pretty much to the center of the blood vessel. Concentration boundary layers, this uh, indicates viscosity effects on diffusion. So we're looking at, again, looking at two different things. One's the viscosity effects on flow and concentration boundary layer, the effects in diffusion. And that should, that concentration boundary layer should lie well within that this velocity boundary layer. We have the thickness ratio, which I just showed you with this equation here. Again, looking at convection and diffusion. Uh, and the ratio is the concentration boundary layer thickness divided by the velocity boundary layer thickness. And it's shown as this capital delta. Um, and again, the equation involves the fluid density, uh, the bulk diffusivity of whatever solute we're thinking about, and the viscosity of the fluid. Okay, this was a popular muddy point, uh, talking about the Sherwood and Schmidt numbers, these dimensionless numbers, and especially when they both start with the same letter, I can see how they might 
kind of blend together after a while. But anyway, these two numbers are dimensionless numbers. Uh, the Sherwood number and the Schmidt number, they mean two different things, um, even though it might take a little explaining for you to see the differences uh, uh, between these two numbers. The Sherwood number is the ratio of convective mass transfer and diffusion rate. So that's the idea behind the Sherwood number. And the Schmidt number represents the ratio of momentum or viscosity diffusion and mass dif diffusion. So they're both ratios, which is why they're both dimensionless numbers, but they are ratios of different things. One we're looking at rates, the other one we're essentially looking at diffusion. So here's the Schmidt number. The Schmidt number, again, the ratio of momentum diffusion to mass diffusion, it is a dimensionless number, like we said, um, and for solutes that diffuse through liquids, the Schmidt, the Schmidt number can be greater than 1, which says to us, if we look at this equation up here, that that boundary layer ratio is less than 1, and meaning our concentration boundary layer is less than our um, velocity boundary layer. Usually, Schmidt number is much, much greater than 1, which suggests that the concentration boundary layer lies well within the velocity boundary layer. And we showed this on, um, first of all, we showed this in um, a Socrative question that we did, and we also showed it in exam 3 um, when we calculated both concentration and velocity boundary layer and compared the two. Here's what the Sherwood number looks like. I'm um, taking into account the mass transfer coefficient multiplied by the length of the vessel, whether it's capillary or something else, the length over which diffusion takes place, and the diffusivity. And these these are actually interrelated. These all these dimensionless numbers can be used to find other dimensionless numbers. So we could have used, although someone already did this, dimensional analysis to tell us that the Sherwood number is a function of the Reynolds number and the Schmidt number. And we can calculate the Sherwood number if we have the Reynolds number and we have the Schmidt number and the dim if we have dimensions of whatever tube we're looking at. Okay, so in terms of, again, in terms of the Reynolds and Schmidt number, we can calculate the Sherwood number, and we can then get um, an idea of whether we have the short contact time solution, which again tells us that the concentration boundary layer is small. And in the case of being in a tube, um, tells us the solute is not penetrated far from the tube wall, and that the concentration boundary layer is much, much smaller than the radius of whatever tube we're looking at. And the radius of whatever tube could also potentially be very close to, anyway, could be very close to the, this, the velocity boundary layer here. So it's basically saying the same sort of thing. The short contact time solution, and again, we can know that sort of thing based on these dimensionless numbers. All right, finally, items that will not be on the final, will not talk about cell growth and production stoichiometry, degrees of reduction, all that stuff. We're not going to talk about basics about microbiology, animal cells, plant cells. I can also tell you we won't have any um, life cycle analysis. Uh, I will not put anything about the um, bioheat equation uh, on the final exam. In fact, I have just posted a um, list of things to study for the final exam. If you have questions about this, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, feel free to stop by my office anytime between now and uh, the time of the final. Uh, I mentioned check my courses for your grades if any of them are missing. Note that I have not graded homework four that homework that had uh, a lot of calculating of Reynolds numbers and 
uh, other dimensionless numbers on a whole lot of unit conversions. Um, so I'm, I will be in the process of grading that in the next couple days, and I will uh, let everyone know when that is done. Um, so um, thank you for the semester, and good luck studying for the final. And again, if you have questions, concerns, etc., please feel free to contact me. My office hours are still posted, uh, but if the door to my office is open, you can feel free to stop by to ask any question and voice any concern you may have regarding the upcoming final uh, or the semester in general. Thank you.